Welcome to the second session of Talk Connect, week one with the spotlight on the Americas. After this morning's keynote address, we will continue this week's program with a session put together between Talk Events and the IAPH, featuring its recently published cybersecurity guidelines. As we all know, our industry is navigating through the process of digitalization, yet cybersecurity continues to be an obstacle. On that note, I am delighted to have Pascal Olivier, President of Maritime Street and Chairman at the IAPH Data Collaboration Committee, as moderator for this session. Pascal will introduce the speakers joining us today this afternoon. However, before we begin, I would just like to mention some housekeeping remarks. Please remember that you may use the chat box on our platform to pose your questions. This will be these will be uh, transferred by one of our colleagues and should you experience any technical difficulties do let us know and a member of our team will be in touch thank you and over to you now pascal well good day everyone very pleased to be uh, with you today mario uh, of course it's been a long time for talk i mean like my last time was in talking Cartagena about two years ago here we are almost back. We're going to be back really in Rotterdam uh, next week. But really very pleased to be with our friend from Latin America and the Caribbean again. Um, today I'm with you to address a very important um, matter that's happened recently. The IPH, which is the International Association of Port and Arbors, uh, released uh, last month the first ever cybersecurity guideline for port and for facilities. Uh, it is a very important event uh, at a time where we dramatically have increase of cyber attacks uh, in different industries, in many industries, and also in particular to the shipping industry. Uh, recently, um, New Orleans, uh, Durban, uh, Cape Town in South Africa has been attacked over summer time. And, and the guidelines released by APH is coming to uh, an important time for our industry uh, in terms of risk and resilience. Um, a year ago, the IPH decided to tackle on um, the cybersecurity issue that was part of the urgent call to action of accelerating digitalization. While we accelerate digitalization, it is important to make sure that all our infrastructure has a critical information infrastructure uh, is resilient uh, from a, a cyber perspective. So the IPH decided to develop those guidelines a year ago, and it was put into the context also of the work of the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which is in 2017 has developed uh, the maritime cybersecurity uh, framework. Um, and, and therefore, early this year, we put a fantastic team of 20 individuals from around the world, uh, from leading ports, and all our colleagues from the World Bank's expert in cybersecurity. Altogether, 20 of two of us were engaged uh, in this four month uh, project to develop those guidelines, to put them in the context of the IMO framework. Um, for that purpose, the IPH submit to the IMO on July 2nd, uh, the guidelines, the document that may, some of you may have seen, it's an 80 pages document, comprehensive framework. Um, and more recently, after submitting this document two weeks ago, importantly, uh, it went through the IMO MSC, the Maritime Safety Committee uh, for uh, review all. And um, we had the pleasure uh, it's an official statement. We have an official pleasure to really uh, to get along uh, the MSC uh, 104 committee, uh, validating the, the fact that the guidelines could be uh, integrated as best practices uh, along the ISO uh, 27N1 and the NIST framework and the BIMCO guidelines, but subject, of course, to the validation as well of the file committee is going to take place uh, in the month of May uh, of next year, since the uh, circular free, which is joined with FAL1 and MSC, is uh, in charge of the guidelines on, on maritime cyber risk management. 
So this is an important uh, step for our industry. Why is this? Uh, it is clear that once you know it, it is fully uh, going through the IMO, MSC, and file committees, uh, it become a crucial working document for the industry at port and, and port facilities and, and port terminal. Um, it is an objective, really, document of method of working uh, for our colleagues. But beyond this, it's going to become also a refresher on character in the context of both insurance and aftermath of incident. Because when tomorrow, starting 22, when a port authority or port terminal going to face a cyber attack, if you are insured uh, by one of the leading cyber companies, cyber insurance company, the insurance company going to go back to you and say, well, uh, you should be familiar with the IPH guidelines, which are best practices under the IMO. And did you implement it? Yes or no? And you can imagine if you have not implemented that, you know, as a best practice and a method of working for uh, managing the risk, uh, it may be a concern. And in the aftermath of the incident, uh, you know, uh, from a legal perspective over time, but eventually the judge will, you know, will look at, they'd say, you know, this is the best practices. Did you implement it really? So it's, it's going to become also jurisprudence and opening to a uh, new legal environment um, in it. So without further ado, I just wanted really to, to explain to you how much the IAPH cybersecurity guidelines for port and for facilities are becoming important to you. So now I'm going to give the floor uh, to our speakers. Um, we have with you two of the fun, two members of the fantastic team that we put together on a global basis uh, to produce the guidelines. Uh, firstly, I will introduce Max Bobis. Max, uh, it's a, a senior expert in cybersecurity in the maritime world and in, in the port world, and uh, is vice president at Hudson Analytics uh, in, out of Washington DC. And we have also um, with us. Also, Mark DePatter. Mark DePatter is the CISO Chief Information Cybersecurity and Security Officer at the Port of Rotterdam, the leading port uh, of Europe. Now, floor is yours, Max. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you, Matteo, and the rest of the talk team for putting this together. And uh, as we get started, uh, following Pascal's introduction, we're going to be focusing on three primary chapters of the uh, of the IAPH guidelines, uh, chapters uh, two, three, and uh, nine, and so we're going to be we're just going to jump into it. So, Matteo, go ahead and proceed to the next slide. Uh, one more. Uh, here we go. So, so uh, to get started, uh, we want to frame things. So, as as ports adopt new technologies, leaders need to acknowledge cyber risk management is is effectively a top level responsibility. More to the point, they need to recognize cybersecurity as an operational imperative. And as Pascal mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, risk transfer on the insurance side. And many of the insurers, as well as many larger organizations, are looking at cyber risk as a peril that needs to be managed. So that'll be a theme coming out. Um, so first, let's acknowledge some of the challenges that are common to ports these days. Number one is competition, the competitive imperative. Trade-offs are always made weighing security, which introduces inefficiency against operations, which seeks efficiency. So this philosophy can place too much at times focus on information technology solutions and systems, and that can unintentionally create vulnerabilities in operational technology systems. Also, cyber risk is everywhere. It's, it's effectively pervasive. Cyber risk touches every aspect of an organization from administration and operations to everything in between. To some leaders, this might seem overwhelming at times, perhaps even insurmountable. And so in, in some instances, they may not even wanna try or at least try to address the challenge of cyber risk. Cyber risk is also difficult to quantify. While there are numerous tools and methods that attempt to quantify what we call value at cyber risk, no common true standard really exists at this point in time. And then finally, people don't like change. It's difficult to change behavior and culture. And this is probably the greatest challenge of all. 
How do you prevent staff from opening phishing emails with embedded links to malware infected sites or from downloading infected attachments? How do you mitigate social media exploitation? Go ahead, next, click next, Mateo. So once port leaders can get past some of these initial roadblocks, more fundamental questions are asked. And these are common questions at the beginning of the process. Mainly, in my opinion, they're what I call foundational in nature. They're the starting points of a cyber risk management discussion. Where do we start? How much do we budget? Who's responsible? And those are just some examples of some of these key questions going forward. Go ahead, next slide. Click it one more time, Mattel. Thank you. So first, let's discuss business impact. Go ahead and click. To answer these questions, there are a few things that leaders must do. In order to determine reasonable levels of investment in cybersecurity, leaders must first understand how a cyber event can impact the organization's ability to function. They need to, they need to know what the potential costs of disruption are. This requires determining actual business impact, and that's achieved through a business impact analysis, or what we call BIA, and the development of realistic cyber loss scenarios. Click again for me, Matteo. Performing a BIA enables leaders to identify and analyze the critical business and operational functions and key assets of systems, as well as to anticipate the potential consequences of a disruptive event. Examples include disruption of key systems or infrastructure, lost income, fines, reputational harm, liability exposure, as Pascal alluded to earlier. Loss scenarios enlighten the BIA process with how a cyber incident can result in real financial loss. By calculating costs for various loss scenarios, leaders can gain insights into what affected assets, data, or infrastructure might trigger the costliest or most disruptive consequences. When developing them, you need to define the scenario, estimate probability, and estimate financial valuations for outcomes. Doing so will enable leaders to potentially understand value at risk regarding their cybersecurity investments. Click next for me. But developing the business case isn't enough. You have to enable organizational resilience, and this requires a more fundamental action. So let's talk about language and communication. And let me be absolutely clear here. Successful cyber risk management begins with and depends on a common understanding of terms. It requires financial grounding and a recognition of shared responsibilities. Terms familiar to some are not necessarily going to be common to all. Misunderstandings can easily arise from inconsistent use of terms, and this creates confusion, such as undisciplined escalation, irregular alerting, and so on. And that can frustrate staff as well as partners. So institu instituting a common language will improve the clarity of cyber communications at organizational and community levels, which is especially important when you're talking about poor community system environments. So I'd click next. Cybersecurity should also be grounded in a financial context. This transformed the cybersecurity conversation into the readily recognizable financial conversation of business. When you establish the cyber risk to money intersection, it provides a framework for informing investment decisions regarding resource identification, allocation, and prioritization. And when we talk about resources, we're talking about what? We're talking about people, processes, tools, and money. And it also empowers leaders with the commercial context and the operational insights necessary to make informed judgments in a consistent manner. Finally, and again, going back to that, that, that common theme of money, dedicated cybersecurity budgets are critical to effective cyber risk management. Dedicated operating budgets sustain cyber risk management and literally fund continuous improvement, which drives organizational cyber resilience, literally. Go ahead, next slide. The single greatest driver of organizational cyber resilience is executive engagement. Leaders must effectively engage. Before investments in technical resources are made, executives should first organize to manage a cybersecurity challenge. You organize by identifying key staff, assign, assign roles, duties, responsibilities, and you grant authorities for them to take action. Cybersecurity oversight should also fall on those who have ultimate responsibility for the governance of the organization itself. And this is the CEO or managing director. And their responsibility includes board level reporting. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the reporting language should be focused on a shared terminology and be fi financially grounded. One highly effective organizational strategy is to 
establish an internal cybersecurity steering committee. Establishing one ensures coordination in the implementation of a cybersecurity program, reduces the potential for duplication and spending, consolidates lines of reporting, manages complex investments, and serves as the primary driver of cyber cultural change. Go ahead, click next. As the organization is ready for action, key strategies for affecting change require leadership to do a couple things. First, the leaders need to initiate and engage in decision making. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Please don't defer all cybersecurity decisions to the IT department. Participate in the analysis. Make a point to know what's at risk in your organization. Know the trade-offs regarding risk exposure, acceptance, avoidance, mitigation, and transfer. Again, a theme we're going to be key themes we're going to be touching on in today's conversation. Also, actively drive cyber risk awareness across the organization. Every individual is a target. Don't forget that. Engaging staff from all functional areas, from operations, legal, procurement, sales, administration, and finance is critical. And work on changing behaviors. Look, change is not easy. To be successful, you need to start with simple steps. Sponsor regular cyber awareness training. Implement a training campaign highlighting email threats and vulnerabilities. These are not expensive propositions to start. And finally, implement governance and accountability. Humans naturally seek out shortcuts. We're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it sometimes when I deal with my daughter, my teenage daughter. Sometimes we'll actively circum people will actively circumvent cybersecurity policies and controls no matter how rigorous. Formalize cybersecurity responsibility in all roles and monitor performance. Go ahead to the next slide. So let's talk about training. So ports on either side of the digital divide face one universal challenge in cybersecurity, and that's managing the human. Human error alone generates enormous cyber risk, and they are the source of most cyber breaches. Employee behaviors, that is our curiosities, our sometimes carelessness, prejudices, and desires, they all collectively represent the weakest link in any cybersecurity program. Remember, cyber risk is asymmetrical in nature. Hackers are only limited by their own imaginations and resource constraints, and they will come at you where you least expect it. Cyber threat actors frequently leverage psychology and behavior of people in their interactions with digital technology. The range of professions, skills, languages, cultures, and the people who interact with ports assets make the task of addressing human risk a huge challenge. Go ahead, next, click next. Training represents a low cost, high value add investment and ultimately the benefits of a more cyber aware workforce or a more cyber resilient competitive organization. When people are trained to recognize cyber threats and understand how to respond to incidents, then the organization itself can be more rapidly recover from cyber disruptions. Next slide. Regardless of a port size or operational complexity, cyber awareness training should be required for all staff accessing data and digitally enabled assets and systems. Wherever possible, cyber training should leverage existing methods. For example, ports subject to the ISPS code are already conducting quarterly drills, and so they should review and expand drill scenarios to accommodate cyber injects that test staff readiness. Updated drills should be the product of a collaborative effort between cybersecurity staff, cyber, cybersecurity, security staff, operations, administration, and so on. This same approach also applies to annual tabletop exercises. They should be modified to test cyber awareness and validate cybersecurity plans. Finally, documenting identified knowledge gaps, response activities, and mitigation recommendations and after action reports will help leaders develop lessons learned in order to pinpoint opportunities for improvement. Taking this approach will inform the continuous improvement process and provide for a more cyber resilient organization. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Pascal. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Max, really to compliment to the point that you just addressed. It's clear also that, um, ladies and gentlemen, that you're gonna be able to find in the, on the IPH guideline on chapter 12, uh, also from a training, after the training, uh, part of, of, of the guidelines, you will find uh, the first also ever uh, port cybersecurity, port and port facility cybersecurity assessment and plan that you're gonna be able to implement within your own environment. What Max brought to you uh, 
uh, on the business of managing risk as one key takeaway. This is not cybersecurity is not an IT matter. Uh, it's not an IT subject. It's not an IT subject for the CIO. This is really, and it is very important to keep that in mind, it is a C-suite subject matter. It is a CEO subject matter first. It's then after all the C-suite, all inclusive. Yeah. So I think it, it's really important that not to address that to your IT manager director or to your CIO, but to address that from a business perspective, business of managing the risk at the board level of the executive committee and above at the board also of the port authority uh, from, your, from your ecosystems. Now I'm going to move to our next speaker, Mark. Mark, floor is yours. Mark, you're going to be addressing uh, the second chapter related to cybersecurity and risk management. Thank you, Mark. Yes, yes. Thank you, Pascal, and thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, cybersecurity, risk management, resilience, where to start? So uh, Max had a talk about, okay, all the prerequisites that need to be filled in. Um, everything that is done at the C level, the management directors, board of directors, the, the budget. Um, so now that all the prerequisites are filled in, okay, where do we start? Where do we begin? Uh, we got the green light um, and how do we start? And what I do and what we do at the Port of Rotterdam is, okay, we start by defining, okay, what is our mission critical data applications and processes? Um, just to give you an example, Port of Rotterdam is responsible for the safe handling of all shipping within the port. That is also our license to operate. Um, and from that uh, process, we define everything uh, and our right to existence. So what we did and where we started was identifying, okay, what systems, data, and processes are involved um, with with our key uh, with our high high risk systems um to give you a, a brief um uh, uh, identification of okay um now you know what the high risk systems are you know um what potentially are the high risks then you start by doing like max told uh, a business impact analysis uh, and a business impact analysis uh, you don't do that from a cybersecurity perspective alone uh, you involve the business, you talk to them, uh, you try to understand, okay, if something were to happen uh, to the system based on the pillars of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, what will be, would be the potential impact for our board, the board facility? Um, to give you a bit, a bit of context, um, with confidentiality, we, we uh, mean the rules and the set of rules that are implied with the system that not everybody can access the data. The integrity is the assurance that the information is trustworthy and accurate. And availability, of course, is the guaranteeing uh, that there is reliable access um, and that it's only by authorized people. And cybersecurity basically rests on these three pillars. So what you have, um, what you need to do is, okay, get a sense of where what is my uh, what are my high risk system and basically what are my crown jewels um, identify them with the business don't look at each system individually but look at the chain of systems um, and then talk to the business make your business impact analysis based on the confidentiality integrity and availability also known as cia trade which is uh, further described in of course chapter three um, and based on those talks, and you, you will get a feeling, okay, this system is needs to be is important uh, because X, Y, Z, the business relies upon it. If it fails, then maybe we need to uh, well have reputational damage, can't comply with rules, regulations, uh, maybe have fines, well, and everything that that comes forth from that. So basically, what you will do is you identify, okay, how important is this? um and then make your uh, analysis based upon that and discuss that with the business i can't stress this enough uh because you can't do it alone and then you have your systems you have your uh supply chain mapped out and from that supply chain you will start by you doing uh well taking security measures of course and this is the one of the steps uh that is 
pretty hard to to uh, describe in 10 minutes, but I will do my best. Um, what you will try to do is to create a defense in depth strategy. And a defense in depth strategy is, is nothing more or nothing less than a set of rules uh, and measures in place to uh, make sure uh, that everybody uh, is well, every system not, that not each system is breached when one uh, measure fails. Um, and what that what that basically means is okay, you start by setting up policies and procedures so that everybody knows where to go and what to implement. Um, then you have your fiscal parameter, maybe you have your firewall, your IDS, your IPS. Um, and after that perimeter, you have your internal network, you can segregate your VLANs, uh, make sure that they don't uh, hop from one VLAN to the next. Then you have your application, uh, your endpoint protection, your server hardening, uh, and after all those steps, you can uh, access the data. So for an attacker, it's, uh, well, maybe the first hop, okay, they took that. Um, but we've, if that fails, you have uh, um, created an opportunity to detect, respond, and to protect uh, your data. Um, so, and I'm, I, I understand if this is, well, a, a concept that is maybe hard to, to understand at first, but that if there are any questions, please let us know, uh, then I can maybe address them during my, my talk. Um, and otherwise I will just continue. So, uh, so yeah, creating multiple layers to defend what's important. And basically you can uh, make the comparison with a the castle. They have a drawbridge, they have towers, they have guards. And basically all what that does is to make sure that if one fails, the next one is in place to so that the attackers can't directly take take over the city. Um, so if you would like to go to the next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. So now that we have our measures in place, uh, we have taken some measures, we know uh, what needs to be done, we have our systems identified. Um, then uh, it's time that everybody takes their roles and responsibilities within the cybersecurity process. And like Max uh, and Pascal already uh, briefly talked about, uh, it's important that everybody in within the organization stakes their responsibilities. But how do you do that? And of course, uh, the tone at the top, so the supervisory board, the board of directors, management directors, C-suite, all need to be behind cybersecurity, um, but then it falls to the first, second, and third line of defense. Um, and basically what the first, second, and third line of defense entails is, um, is as follows. The first line is responsible for setting up the controls, implementing the cybersecurity measures and making sure that um, that well basically the, the systems are up to date up to speed based on the guidelines set by the second line so what i mean by that is uh, the second line helps the first line in setting up uh, cybersecurity so the second line uh, yes if you thank you uh, the second line that's something i'm also uh, within my organization a part of and what, what we do with, with our team is setting up guidelines, making sure they are in accordance with rules and regulations, with best practices, making sure that the risks are identified correctly, like I discussed in a previous step, um, and making sure that the policies fit our risk appetite and risk exposure. So for instance, our password policy, I said, uh, we, with our team, we set that to 15 characters, um and some some extra some some extra options and of course we need to change that every six months um so we set that from a second line and then we go to the first line and we tell them okay these are the policies set please implement them um, and we will see to it that you do um, and you need to do this because well we have a certain risk exposure and we need to make sure everybody everything is uh, well, set up and safe and in, in accordance with the risk uh, appetite. Um, and we also check the first line if they did it, if they set it up. And we do that not because we like to check them, but because to make sure, okay, these are the policies and procedures and appointments that we made in processes. And these are also implemented by the right, uh, by the right people. The third line of defense is, a, is an optional step. And what you 
tend to see is that it happens in larger organizations. So in large organizations, you have a third line that checks the second and first line if they do everything in accordance uh, well with, with the board of directors and C-suite approval, of course. Um, but it's important also with this to make sure the governance is set up correctly from the start, because otherwise uh, you will be looked at from a cybersecurity perspective and you will get the responsibilities, you will get the blame, um, and you can't win basically because, well, like Max started, uh, it's about creating efficiencies and delivering the goods um, and not about creating inefficiencies with maybe a, a second step authentication um, and you will be looked up, down upon. But if you in, uh, incorporate the business, make sure they understand why they are doing this, get the board's approval from the first, second and third line and everybody takes their um, role within that uh, cybersecurity process, then you will more likely than not have a, a success, a higher success rate in setting up cybersecurity. Um, so yeah, basically that, that wraps up uh, my, uh, the presentation that we had today, I think back to Pascal um, for the Q&A. Uh, thank, th thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, and, and before uh, we move to the Q&A, uh, just a note um, to the audience, uh, you are more than welcome to ask us as many questions as, as you want. Uh, but before we do so, I just want to conclude on Mark uh, part uh, presenting about the um, uh, cybersecurity uh, risk management. Again, when you listen to Mark, we're coming back to the governance. It's not about tech, even Mark addressed a little about tech in the first part, but the governance um, of implementing cybersecurity guidelines is, is related to the uh, framework that we are in. We are quite very similar into the financial world of a lot of, of all CFOs around the world where we, we get the international financial regulation, the IFRS, who are conducting our life every day, we are reporting where audits, uh, internal audit and external audit is key. And really we are quite in the same environment. We are going back to the C-suite uh, to the chief financial officer, to the chief legal officer, and to the CEO about reporting to the executive committee, reporting to the board, reporting to the shareholder, in particular for the terminal operator and the global terminal operator. And, and we're going back to uh, this point about the legal environment and the consequence of to be organized or not to be organized. Um, and so we're going to we're gonna start our... Uh, um, a round, a round of questions here. Uh, Max, when, when we look at the, uh, when we look at what's happened recently, uh, we had the business case of Transnet in, the, in South Africa. Um, a few days uh, after the attack, really the port operation were not working. They have to go back to paper processes and to human interaction and everybody, the container terminal operating system was not functioning for, for, for days. And they were forced to call for force majeure because all the ships were U-turning and leaving South Africa. All the supply chain of South Africa and the North and the Lakes country were disrupted. And, and because of this, they have to call for force majeure. So that demonstrate, Max, about the importance about your legal responsibility, especially for transferring the risk um, um, to an insurance company. Uh, one of the companies that we, we published in our Port and Arbor magazine uh, a few days ago, Aon, said that the average time uh, for a breach just before going back to normal is 6 to 14 days. So I think insurance is, is really super critical in transferring the risk map. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple things to, to discuss. So let's, let's talk about force majeure first. So... So force majeure, you know, we talk about acts of God, things that are outside of our control. But organizations, companies, entities that are looking to invoke force majeure, majeure they first have to demonstrate that the ransomware attack or the cyber attack at issue, it actually falls within the scope of their force majeure clause, the actual language of the clause. The specific language of the provision itself is the most important consideration when, ev when evaluating a particular event and whether or not it actually can be considered to excuse performance. 
So when a, when a force majeure provision enumerates particular categories, like if it's called out as a ransomware attack, the specific nature of the attack, like for example, is it a ransomware attack? Is it a DDoS attack? These all play a role, as well as whether or not attribution could be attached to the perpetrators. For example, is it, was it affected by a nation state? Uh, other force majeure provisions might be phrased more broadly to include any event beyond what is considered reasonable control by the organization. Um, and, and reasonable control actually starts to, it, it, it dovetails into the latter part of your, your comments about insurance. And, and you know, uh, the thing about insurance is, is that it is, it is an extraordinary opportunity in the world of the insurance industry. And where we, where we talk about, well, how do we insure? How do we transfer risk as part of a risk management program? One of the things that um, uh, we have to be careful to, I, 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 to not fall into is, is to look at insurance as the solution. Moral hazard, uh, for example, comes into play. So we want to avoid moral hazard. So there's a, there's a, a briefing I often give where we look at the risk curve, the cyber risk curve. In the upper left, there's a lot of a lot of assumed cyber risk an organization enjoys, and there's very little cybersecurity capability. So in the IAPH guidelines, we talk a lot about cybersecurity capabilities. We talk about maturity. We, we talk about uh, organizational change, right? So a lot of what would um, what what we 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 look to drive uh, guidance to the end user for is get organized first. And then start to put together a risk management plan that's coordinated, that brings together all the aspects of the organization, not just the operational technologies, not just the IT technologies, not, not just the people in charge of information security, um, but it's everybody, right? And get organized. And then at some point, as you drive that risk down that curve, risk transfer becomes an effective aspect of that risk management program where you're pulling some of that risk Again, off what? Off your balance sheet. And that goes back to the conversation we had at the earlier part when I was chatting about, you know, tying it to the, the financial aspects of, of risk management. Uh, th thank you, Max. I mean, and, and just to follow on on this governance matter, uh, Mark, uh, in your responsibilities as CISO at Port of Rotterdam, you are directly reporting to the executive committee. So. Uh, the other day, I, I was meeting you in, in Port of Rotterdam, that was early September, uh, and you were telling me that you were going to present the, the report, the current situation status about what is happening at cybersecurity. Can you describe more about in your responsibilities, what you do with the executive committee, how that working? Yes, of course. Um, well, of course, within our responsibilities, uh, what we made clear is that we made the executive committee uh, and responsible for cybersecurity. Of course, they can't do that on, on their day-to-day -day basis. So what they did is they delegated that, that responsibility to us, uh, especially to me as a, as a CISO, but to me as a t uh, within our team. And what we do is we, each year, um, we have a discussion with them. Okay, these is, are the new threats. These are the emerging risks. Uh, this is the cybersecurity roadmap that we have from a Port of Rotterdam perspective. These are the rules, regulations that we need to comply to. Um, and then, of course, in accordance with them, we give them a suggestion, okay, this is what we should do, this is the budget that we need, um, and this is the time it will take, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we do uh, during the year, we give, we give them updates, of course, about what is happening, um, about maybe key decisions that they need to make. Um, um, and basically what we try to do is put them in their roles of end responsibility for cybersecurity. So, um, and of course, what uh, with that being said, we also report each year to the uh, supervisory board. And the supervisory board is we give uh, a, a document one once a year, which is of course uh, at, uh, uh, checked by the C level um, to give also an update about cybersecurity. So the whole governance structure within the board is that set up in a way that we made sure that everybody takes their responsibilities. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, the, um, uh, in, in the question from the audience, um, there, there is um, Max, I think it's gonna be one for you. Um, 
what is the best way to get cybersecurity higher on the agenda that, that it is not uh, the case in your organization today? So how to bring it to the top? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pascal. And I think and I, I see the other comment prior to that about how to get, I think, which leads to what are the first steps to take in, in, in terms of, you know, yeah. getting started with cyber risk management and, and both questions kind of are, are intertwined. Right. And so the very first thing I will uh, uh, mention is really getting organized and, 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 and getting the executive leadership to assume responsibility. I mean, ultimately, when you have an organization like in Rotterdam with Mark and his team, you have the, the balance sheet to afford an individual like Mark, who's a CISO, who can come in. And, and, and yes, the, a lot of the organizations out there have the ability, the organizational structure to accommodate that framework in terms of managing risk. And the CISO, of course, and Mark can speak to it with you know, firsthand knowledge, is, is that you have that direct board access. Now, most ports and, and terminal operators around the world don't have the balance sheet to have those types of resources available, at least right away. And so the first thing we would recommend is don't go out and fall into the trap of buying something like a pen test, right? I mean, we get, at, we get asked a lot, well, you know, I, I, I want to engage you guys. I want to do a pen test. Well, do you have a cybersecurity program in place? Well, no, but we know we need to do a pen test. So, <laughs> so it's really about getting organized. And so a lot of the, I think the one thing I would mention here is, is establishing that, that leadership team in the organization with executive you know, sponsorship, you know, the, the, the main cheerleader, the main leader is the CEO or the managing director and pull together representatives from all aspects of your organization, from operations, engineering, um, you know, security, health and safety, and put them around the table and organize so that you can start a regular recurring meeting to, to understand, to try and understand what you have uh, and, and really that first step, if you don't, if you don't know where to start, start with a capability assessment, understand what you have and understand what vulnerabilities may exist based on your lack of capabilities in certain areas. And you'll identify strengths and that you can then build on. But the most important thing I think to start is, is that organizational aspect. And the best part about it is you're not necessarily buying technology right at the beginning. Because I know with some executives who don't have the experience like Mark, um, you know, they think that they have to go out and spend millions of dollars or euros or pounds or whatever and buying expensive technology to, you know, to address cyber risk. And the real answer is in the beginning, it, you don't have to do that. It, it's about getting organized. It's about putting a plan together, assessing what you've got, and then putting the, the plan, the policy, the procedures, the strategy in place and moving forward there. It's a long marathon. It's not something you can solve with a single bullet. Yeah, th thank you, Max. And, and, and to complement this, we, uh, there was one last question here. It's, could you recommend any ROI metrics to effectively assess cybersecurity uh, implementation? We are going back to how much enough is enough uh, as an ROI. Both of you, how would you uh, address that question? Mark, do you want me to start? And yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, you know, I'll go back again to what I said earlier uh, regarding understanding what you know, put together a business impact analysis, and then use that process to develop what we call loss scenario analysis. The loss scenario analysis is an activity where it forces you and your team. It needs to be complement or sorry, needs to be collaborative in nature. You can't do it with one or two people. You need to bring the different stakeholders from across the organization. Again, I'm going to go use use that little working group. You know, use the key p, key individuals and the stakeholders in the working group to develop loss scenarios. And in the process of developing loss scenarios, you can actually start to quantify what are the assets, what are the systems, what are the services that are most valuable and most critical to our survival as an organization. And, and so that's a starting point in terms of putting together some of the metrics. And those are things you don't want to do one time, but you want to revisit them on a regular basis, whether it's annual, every six months to start, and then tweaking them and modify them. And then once you have those developed, you can start, you can start framing that conversation 
in the conversation of what? Of business and money. Yeah, yeah thank you, Mike. Do you want to compliment Mark on this one? Yeah, maybe just to compliment indeed. Um, once you have that discussion about business and money, you can also leverage, okay, we have a security operating center that costs X amount of dollars um and we expect that to have an impact or uh, of course a, a positive impact on the risk to mitigate that uh, and then you can start leveraging okay uh what is our risk appetite from a from a uh, company perspective um what do we want to spend and then you can get into the metrics of okay is this worth it or aren't we uh, going to take this measure because it's too time or cost or costly yeah, the reality is that from uh, to go on uh, on this ROI thing, uh, when you're gonna have the opportunity to look at the guidelines, uh, we are going beyond uh, the port authority by itself or the port terminal by itself. We are going on the ROI also to the port community, uh, to the port community locally or to the port ecosystem at large. So you can uh, enlarge your resilience because you are a critical information infrastructure and you are hyper-connected through APIs, EDIs, you name it, you know, uh, with your customers, with your partners, uh, with your ecosystems at large. So we need to have a granularity of the cyber resilience really at the local level, at the ecosystems level, at the national level, also because ports are critical infor information infrastructure and critical uh, infrastructure, indeed. Mark, just to go back to the um, cyber defense line, uh, de no. defense line works. Uh, we have one question. If you want to elaborate a little more about how that works, the cyber lift, how, how do you make it happen? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I can uh, use an example from from my work. What I do day to day operations is, um, well, what I do and what what our team does is we are in the the second line of defense. Uh, basically, what that entails is, like I stated, we make uh, we, we set up the guidelines for the first line in accordance with well best practice rules, regulations, of course. Um, and just to give you an example, um, we see certain risks emerging: the risk of ransomware, the risks of well um, data loss, uh, and we set up okay. We see these risks emerging all over the world. We try to incorporate as much as uh, threat intelligence as we can, of course. And then we start looking at, OK, what are the current uh, set and uh, rules and regulations in place for the systems? So for instance, uh, we made a business impact analysis on one of the systems. Um, and with the emerging risks, we saw, OK, um, this system needs some extra guidelines uh, and extra uh, measures to make sure that if if something happens, they don't have uh, well, there's a complete fallout from the portable stone perspective. So what we then do is then we start looking at the first line of defense, which are responsible for setting up uh, the systems and the uh, the parameters uh, which the system need to adhere to, and then uh, well, we start discussing with them. Okay. Uh, what do you need? Uh, this is a new risk. Uh, this is a new measure we, we want to implement. Um, and then we, we use them and we facilitate uh, a platform for them to well uh, implement implement the risks. And uh, maybe it's it's uh, hard to talk about it uh, in, in five or ten minutes. But in the guidelines, there is a, a whole uh, well, sub chapter, of course, divided in these three lines and how they work together. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your support in, in this. Uh, Max, we have a question related to capacity building. And um, uh, and the question is, what training schemas for staff would you recommend to port and port terminal aiming at integrating the cybersecurity best practices? It is clear that our document that we produce um, is dedicated to the C-suite. Now, the question is how we move down in the organization and train. And, and of course, it, it's a big question that we have on the industry since we release the guidelines. Uh, IMO has been called on this matter. The World Bank also has been called. How would, what would be your, your recommendation in terms of, of training to the inside the organization? Sure. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you for the question. Um, training, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate on training. It probably re represents some of the greatest return on investment an organization can make 
uh, in its people uh, to make it more cyber resilient. So to come back to your question, a lot of the, a good, a, a vast number of uh, ports and terminals are regulated under the ISPS code. One of the things that we did when we drafted the regulation or the, uh, the guidelines was that we wanted to make sure that we embrace that, right? And, and, and the key thing is to leverage uh, methodologies, practices, things that are occurring inside an organization that we can build on that don't really drive too much disruption in introducing new things. And, and that will help in, you know, drive acceptance among the end users, as well as make it easier to implement in terms of those individuals responsible for the delivery. And so to come to the question directly, uh, number one, uh, there are lots of options out there in the market in terms of web-based uh, tools that companies or organizations can procure on an ad, ad hoc or even on a recurring basis. Uh, there are companies out there that provide bespoke training, both live as well as virtual. Uh, there is under the ISPS code, the framework for drills and exercises that are mandated, uh, that are responsible, that the port facility security officers are responsible for organizing and delivering. I would highly recommend as a way to drive integrated awareness is to in, develop injects or cyber injects into the drill and exercise methodologies. And I would make sure that when you design those injects, whether it's for the drills or the annual uh, exercises, get other, uh, uh, engage your colleagues internally. They are, they are, they are a wealth of, uh, of, of, of insight and specifically they're aware of, of what's going on inside your organization. And so the injects that can be adapted into those methods can be specific to your, your, your organization. And when you perform those, those exercises, expand the universe of individuals who participate in them. Don't limit them just to security staff bring in people from admin, bring in people from the operations section who are maybe, you know, bring in the people who are responsible for finance and administration. So I would, those are the, you know, those are the things that I would look at um, in terms of developing your, your cybersecurity awareness programs. Thank you, Max. To just change about the subject matter here. Margaret is one matter that you did on cover, which is about the intersection between cyber and physical. Uh, can you, uh, tell us more about it. The yeah, of course, there's the cyber, physical, the the IT, the OT uh, intersection. Um, that's uh, something we also, as a port of the Dom, struggled with uh, because we're seeing. Uh, luckily for us, we didn't have a lot of OT OT systems, but what we're more and more seeing is, of course, the need um, to connect these OT systems, which are well, not in, in, in essence, not designed to be on the, uh, the IT network um, to, to the IT network because, well, we want to work there from a distance. Uh, we don't want to have people staffed there because, well, it's, uh, it's a hassle to, to get there. Well, and anything you can uh, imagine, of course. And what we're seeing is, well, it's, it's easy to connect them to the, to the IT uh, systems. Um, and they they cause they can cause a great risk uh, for the for the companies um, that maybe don't know or or do know about them. Um, so what we try to do from a port of Rotterdam perspective is also um, make it insightful. From okay, these are OT systems. These these are IT. How can we connect them in a safe way? Um, and there are a lot of also talking with the business, understanding okay, what is the need for this. Uh, why do we want this? Um, and then making sure that if it's if it happens, that it happens under the right circumstances. So moving back to that first and second line, uh, then we from a second line have stand uh, standardized IT OT uh, linking uh, guidelines uh, for the organization. And the first line then needs to implement those. Give us the heads up that they did did that. Um, prove to us that it works securely maybe conduct a pen test on it depending on how high the risk is um, and from that we can move forward in a secure way and we know for sure that we're not exposing ourselves to the itot uh, risks uh, thank you mark uh, mark and max i'd like to engage you and uh, as a last subject matter today uh, to discuss about information sharing uh, 
UMAX are of course based in the US. Uh, the US is like the Netherlands. Uh, you are part of a uh, legal framework of critical infrastructure on homeland security or national security uh, for the Netherlands. So at the government level and at the defense level, the port authority or the port terminal are identified to be critical infrastructure. So therefore, you become into an environment where you get regulations, how you need to get organized, but also you need to report and you need to share. And can we discuss, you know, with both of you about information sharing and the importance of information sharing at the national level? Max? Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Information sharing has been a challenge to, 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 in, to get some momentum going in the maritime domain. And in the, it started in the financial sector and the defense industry where and now, nowadays they, 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 they're like a well-oiled machine. In the maritime space, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, ports and port authorities and terminal operators are critical infrastructure. And so they are identified as such. And I believe also in the EU, they're recognized as well. And so there are mechanisms in place where you have information sharing and analysis centers. Uh, and they have information sharing agreements with the Department of Homeland Security to curate uh, the exchange of information as well as to anonymize that sharing both up and down uh, in both the collection from the end users uh, for the anonymization and dissemination out to participants. And it's it, there was um, uh, uh, recently established the, the Maritime Transportation uh, System ISAC that was formed earlier last year. And so far it's, it's, it's gaining some good momentum. And uh, I'm a big believer in information sharing and uh, I, I can't emphasize it enough uh, in terms of the benefits derived. And, and, and there are mechanisms, if you don't have it, for those, for those in the audience uh, who may not have those mechanisms in place at the, with the government and private sector, I would encourage you to leverage your port community and again, get organized, develop uh, like a port community, you know, committee and populate it with key stakeholders or primary points of contact for security and information exchange. And there's ways to go about doing it. NIST has some best practices out there that you can draw on that are freely available. So Mark, we're getting to information sharing in Rotterdam, uh, you have organized yourself, but also you report also with the Ministry of Defense on those things. Yeah, that's correct. Um, we, we get information from the Ministry of Defense and we, we give information that uh, they do that via uh, malware, uh, malware information sharing platform. Um, so they give us information about, well, uh, attacks that are happening worldwide and indicators of compromise. Uh, and also what we try to do from a Port of Rotterdam perspective, like Max uh, elaborated on, we try to involve our community, the port, uh, the Port of Rotterdam, but also together with the Port of Antwerp, we set up the European Maritime ISAC uh, to elaborate a more, well, working on an international level um, and to getting that, uh, to sharing that, in, that information and what we're seeing and what we're seeing more and more um is that that companies well struggle to keep up that's that's one thing that's for sure because uh there's a lot happening and we have all the well we, we have the luxury of having that processes in place but it helps to to share and to talk about uh to share information threat information but also when um when an attack did occur or a near miss did occur to share that and to be be open about that and what we try to do from a port of Dam perspective is facilitate that uh, via the uh, the isaac we have nationally but also internationally thank you mark matteo as you can see we can talk for hours we just only covered about three chapters of the 12th chapter of the guidelines i think that everybody understood that it was for c-suite but uh let you to wrap up for the audience again well no don't worry pascal thank you very much to all three of you uh, indeed this is a topic that can go on for hours and that is very relevant for the industry so for those of you in the audience that would like to learn more about cybersecurity, please bear in mind that uh, next week, uh, as part of our on-site conference in Rochester, we will have another cybersecurity session with Pascal, again, moderating and 
another set of wonderful speakers. And this session will be available on demand uh, starting the third week of Talk Connect with Spanish subtitles as well. So I, I do encourage you to log on, to watch it, to share. And as Pascal and everyone has said, cybersecurity is just not a matter for the IT person. It's something that uh, is transversal to the port and terminals sector. Thank you all. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Mario. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye -bye. Have a good week at Talk Connect. Okay. Thank you.